The Packers today wouldn't be where they're at if it wasn't for Bob Harlan. Harlan and Favre. What Lambeau Field is now is largely due to those two guys. There's nothing like, first of all, playing in Lambeau Field. Second of all, throwing a touchdown pass, winning the game at the end. He's playing the most demanding position in the toughest sport, and he's there every single Sunday. You talk about grit, you talk about will, and, um, and he certainly had all that. He played the game the way you would wish everybody would play every sport. Gentlemen, this is the most important play we have. The play we must make, though. Cut! 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 The Vic Lombardi Trophy is coming home where it started. I thought Lambeau Field with a little tin fence around it was perfect. But it was dictated to us, if we're going to remain in this league, and if we're going to remain competitive, not just on the football field, but competitive financially, we absolutely have to do something with the stadium. It was built in 1957. There's not many of those around anymore, so people want to see Lambeau Field just like they'd want to see the Boston Garden or uh, Madison Square Garden. January 21st, 2000. Packer President Bob Harlan boldly announces plans for a $295 million renovation to historic Lambeau Field. The NFL had evolved, and he needed to focus on more than just football. He needed to focus on the stadium. He needed to focus on Lambeau Field as a game day attraction. If we can save the history and tradition of Lambeau Field, do this redevelopment, and keep this stadium open 365 days a year, we're gonna stabilize the financial future of this franchise. We're gonna enable Green Bay to remain a viable part of the National Football League for years to come. The project includes the addition of a 376,000 square foot atrium designed to stretch beyond five stories tall. In order to really leverage the Packers brand to its hilt, you needed to have it become a year-round destination. The Hall of Fame was located a couple of blocks away if we could get the Hall of Fame to move in here too and then have an area where you can have business meetings and weddings. All those things just, just led into becoming a destination. People want to come here. They want to be a part of it. Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson signs a stadium renovation bill paving the way. A referendum is put on the ballot, one that establishes a half cent per dollar sales tax to help fund the Lambeau redevelopment. For what this is going to cost you, a half a percent. You can't buy what we have here, all the impact that it has. It needs approval from the voters of Brown County. You would have thought we were asking every family to contribute ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to help us build a stadium. Despite an indisputably large and impassioned fan base, selling a mostly pragmatic community on a yes vote proves to be a greater challenge than ever imagined. The thing that killed us was the word tax. And the State Fiscal Bureau, not the Packers, the State Fiscal Bureau said this tax is going to cost the average Brown County citizen 13 cents a day or $47 a year. That's a Friday night fish fry. I told one lady, she said, well, I don't know if I can vote for that. I said, what are you going to do on Sunday afternoon? She said, well, I'm going to watch the Packers. I said, thanks, I'll take your vote. Bob Harlan hits the pavement, literally fervently working to get support from divided voters. I went and stood in front of Walmart for an hour and, and talked to people coming in and going out. And then I stood in front of Sam's Club for an hour doing the same thing. Then we went over to De Pere, Green Bay suburb, and I went door to door in the afternoon. He never quite knows where he stands, with votes or lack thereof. It's 50-50. It really was. I, I could talk to 10 people coming out of a store and Five would love it. Five would say, you people don't need it. You're fine. Harlan never gives up on the stadium renovation or the fans, whom he considers the single most important part of the history of the Green Bay Packers. Harlan worked tirelessly to push through the improvements, the renovation at Lambeau Field. I had one gentleman who called me out of clear blue and said, Bob, I was going to vote no. But he said, I saw you out on the curb today, and he said, I'm going to vote yes because of the effort. I kept thinking, what do we do if we lose it? 
Following an uncertain nine months, voters ultimately approve a referendum by a narrow 53 to 47 percent margin. The community stepped up, and it's always been a community team. Harlan is exhausted, but his vision can finally be put in motion. The three-year project begins. It was great relief. It represents a concerted effort by the community to have a facility that puts Green Bay on the map. Not only did we get a stadium, we got the atrium and the restaurant and the Hall of Fame and, and administrative offices and coaching offices and locker rooms and weight rooms. We got a lot for $295 million. I really believe winning helped that. I think the Packers winning the Super Bowl in 97 helped us get the referendum. When you come to Lambeau Field today, Lambeau Field is a house that Brett Favre built. This all doesn't happen without Brett Favre. His success, him leading to the Packers winning, made all of this possible. There's absolutely no question about that. The beginning of the 2003 season, the culmination of a three-year project, is marked by unveilings and ribbon cuttings. It just upped the whole level of the fan game day experience. This is Lambeau Field, a professional sports cathedral. It, it's one of the great venues of all of professional sports internationally. It's a place that's on people's bucket lists from all around, not the United States, all around the world, that they want to see Lambeau Field. A football stadium, particularly one that's home of such a storied franchise has got to be the, be the best monument that uh, a city can have. Towering 14-foot statues of Curly Lambeau and Vince Lombardi are poised in the plaza, sculpted by a husband and wife team from the heart of Bears country in Illinois. Lambeau and Lombardi are chosen because they led the Packers to a combined 11 championships now forever overlooking their hallowed ground. I wish that some of those people that had the foresight to keep the franchise alive could see what it is now, because I'm sure they'd be amazed. In 2000, Mike Sherman is hired as the new head coach for the Packers. When he is pegged to return to Green Bay, Sherman is the offensive coordinator for the Seattle Seahawks. This follows a previous two-year stint with the Packers as an assistant under Mike Holmgren during the 97 and 98 seasons. His first year includes some notable highlights. One, November 6th at home against the Minnesota Vikings. Antonio Freeman scores an improbable 43-yard touchdown reception on Monday Night Football. Freeman catches it on the rebound after it bounces off defender Chris Dishman's shoulder and face mask. Freeman scoops it up inches from the ground. Chris Dishman. Wait a oh, second. Wait a minute. It Freeman picked it Freeman's up. Hands. It bounced into his hand. He takes Touchdown. it in the end zone. We win. Touchdown. Packers win. Dishman tipped it. It looked like he broke it up. I thought the play was over. Freeman made the grab, took it into the end zone. Touchdown, Packers. 43-yard touchdown, and they win. A thrilling overtime win over the Vikings. The Packers end the 2000 season with a 9-7 record. The following February, 2001, Ron Wolf announces his retirement. He leaves the organization after the April draft. Ron Wolf had the guts and the courage to come in here and make dramatic changes that totally changed this franchise and turned it around. During Wolf's reign as general manager from 1992 through 2000, the Packers have the second best record in the NFL behind only San Francisco. Oh, it was a true transformation because my years growing up, the Packers hadn't won. They record seven consecutive winning seasons, qualify for the playoffs six times, and of course, are Super Bowl 31 champions. During the free agency period, we had the best record in all of football. When everybody said that free agency is going to kill the Green Bay Packers, he came here after 24 years of mediocrity, and five years later, he won Super Bowl 31. We looked for winners, and I think that was a big part of it. 
without Reggie White, that would never have happened, uh, the Super Bowl and, and our success. So uh, kudos to, to Ron Wolf uh, for making that happen. There's only one way you can do this, and it's hard work. You have to have the wherewithal to sit and study these players. It's an opportunity for, uh, for teams to get better, but it's also an opportunity for teams to make mistakes. The process of scouting that Ron kind of implemented has lasted a long time and is still very much part of the NFL today. We always talked about our type of player, the Packer type of players, and that was important. We wanted those guys to be Packers forever. When you pick a player, you're picking a player for the Green Bay Packers. It's not Ron Wolf's player, it's not Ted Thompson's player, it's not this guy's but It's a player for the Green Bay Packers. So let's make sure that that, that guy can play. Ron Wolf was a leader. His impact on the entire organization. There's a lot of ups and downs along the way, but working for Ron was a, it is a kind of um, experience that you don't forget. Having a guy like Ron around, who tells you like it is, who's not afraid to make the tough call. It spreads an attitude, and attitudes are contagious. What you see is what you get. That's why I totally lo love about Ron is he's very direct, very matter of fact. I didn't have to worry about what he thought. I knew what he thought, and I could trust him. When I took the job here, everybody says, what goals did you have? Well, I wanted to win 100 games in 10 years. Everybody said, that's unrealistic. Well, we did it in nine years. In one of the last deals orchestrated by Ron Wolf, he trades for running back Amon Green from Seattle. Green will later become the Packers' all-time leading rusher. When Ron Wolf retired, Bob went back to the old model um, of the way it was with Lombardi and later with Bart Starr and, and others uh, of making the head coach the general manager. 2001, Sherman succeeds Wolf as general manager in addition to his head coaching duties. Mike was a very intense coach. My first year he was the GM and the coach. So he very intense, he lets you know in a heartbeat when you messed up and what the expectations were and how fast you needed to correct it. Just one week into the regular season, September 11th, 2001. We were planning for a road trip to New York and uh, we, somebody down the hall says, hey, you know, turn on the TV, something's going on. And many of us did that, like, like everyone else in the country, just transfixed to these images out of New York. Militants associated with an Islamic extremist group hijack four planes and carry out suicide attacks against targets in the United States. People looked up to the NFL to lead, not just in the entertainment space, but also in society. We've played such an important role in coming back from tragic circumstances like 9-11. The Packers host the first nationally televised Monday night game following the attacks. The mood leading up was uh, one of respectful anticipation. You know, we will not be defeated by this act. You know, we need to re reclaim our lives and the things that we enjoy. And as a society, we, we need to move forward. Linebacker Chris Gizzard an Air Force graduate and reservist, leads the team onto the field. Running out of the locker room with a uh, flag held high. It's not just what it brings to the community, it's what it brings to the whole country. Sports has that way of uh, bringing people together, but just that communal uh, energy and, and, and focus of attention and, and, and working together towards something. Coming together as communities is something in terms of pride, in terms of respect, in terms of need, in terms of value, in terms of 
how human beings function as a group to the best that they can. Brett Favre continues to start each game in 2001. It seemed like he would play forever. He was invincible. What he had was not only the toughness, you can get sucked in by Brett's old buddy, old shocks, you know, little attitude, but he really wanted to run through your face. Yeah, I just love to play the game. And to me, the challenge was playing at a high level. And the more I did it, the more determined I was to repeat it again. He leads the team to a 12 and four season, second place in the NFC Central. The record is repeated in 2002, but this year, the Packers win the division, now called the NFC North. They won 25 straight games at home at Lambeau Field which is second best all time. So if you think about that, that's almost three NFL seasons where they did not lose at home and they, they seemed invincible when they played at Lambeau Field. Only this time, the Packers lose a home playoff game for the first time in team history. They fall to Atlanta 27-7 in an NFC wild card game. following the postseason disappointment of 2002. Late in the 2003 season, key memorable moments helped cement the Packers' first place position. December 14th at Qualcomm Stadium in San Diego, long standing records fall. Running back Amon Green breaks Jim Taylor's single season rushing record. and kicker Ryan Longwell breaks Don Hudson's all-time scoring record as the Packers beat the Chargers 38-21. Just one week later, Brett Favre receives devastating news. Did I contemplate not playing? It crossed my mind. His father and high school football coach, Irv Favre, has died of a heart attack. That's tough. We know the story about Brett and his dad, um, how much he meant to him. But in his heart, he wanted to play. He knew that his dad would have wanted him to play. The Packers are scheduled to take on the Raiders in Oakland the very next night. Knowing that his mind may not be all the way there, and he needed us to make sure he, 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 we could hold him up. The question in my mind was, can I block all this out for three hours? and play the best game I've ever played in my life. And I didn't know if I could do that. Football is an escape. It's escape from problems. It's a chance for you to be around 53 brothers and all share the common goal of, of going out and trying to be successful and win. We were a team. We were a family. And when a family member is hurt, we step up. And we step up to protect, and you step up to provide healing and comfort. I need to play. I wanted us to win because we needed to win at that time. But I wanted to play so well um, for a lot of reasons, but obviously the, the most important reason to honor my father. To see him make the sacrifice, and I say sacrifice, and stand up in front of that football team and tell us he was going to play, that meant a lot. I mean, that's brotherhood. Brett needed to be there just as much as we needed him to be there. We wanted our stellar quarterback to be there throwing the ball, delivering the ball, giving us the best opportunity to win. Brett throws for an astonishing 399 yards and four touchdowns. I wish I didn't have, you know, to, to, to talk about a game in which people are bragging on me. You know, I would love for it to be, well, far played okay but my father is still alive and able to see the rest of my career. I think everybody just wanted to leave it all on the line and, and just execute as great as we could. Brett had some of the worst throws I've seen Brett have in that game. If you go back and look at the footage, they were underthrown, overthrown. The reads were a second off, timing was a bit off. 
but not one player dropped the ball. We had wide receivers jumping all over people, fighting off two and three defenders. If you believe in magic, <laughs> it was happening that night. <laughs> the Packers trounce Oakland 41 to seven in this nationally televised Monday night game. I wanted people to say, oh, that was a heck of a send off. And, and it was way better than I could have uh, imagined. January 4th, 2004. Before the start of overtime in a wild card playoff game at Lambeau, Seattle wins the coin flip. And quarterback Matt Hasselbeck then makes a brash proclamation. The Seahawks end their first possession with a punt. The Packers go three and out. On Seattle's second possession in overtime, Packers cornerback Al Harris picks off Matt Hasselback's throw and sprints to the end zone, directly past former Packers coach Mike Holmgren. Packers win 33-27. It is the first defensive touchdown to decide an NFL sudden death postseason game. Just one week later, January 11th, a divisional playoff game in Philadelphia. The Packers lose to the Eagles, 2017, in overtime, when the defense can't stop a fourth and 26 in the closing one minute and 12 seconds. Destiny is not to be. The 2003 Packers magical run comes to an end. In early 2005, the Packers returned to the organizational structure that was so successful under Ron Wolf, separating coach and general manager duties. By the time they got to 2005, the team had kind of aged, and they needed somebody to come back and bring them back to their roots. Ted Thompson was that guy. First guy that Mike Holmgren wants to take to Seattle is Ted Thompson. And first thing he does out there is produce and build a Super Bowl team. When I was ready to go and find somebody here, Ted was the only one I wanted. I actually went down to Mike Sherman, who had both titles at that time, and I told Mike what I was going to do. It had uh, hurt his ego that he was no longer the GM, felt he had failed. Mike, is a, Mike Sherman's a very proud and good man. He said, why, why are you doing this? And I said, because of what it's doing to you. He was a changed person. Thompson is entrusted with full authority over the team's football operations. He retains Sherman as head coach. The organization itself was, was fairly set in its way. There were some changes in responsibilities that we, we initiated as we got here, but it was still a place where you could go win games. Ted was about as consistent as he come. He believed and what he would say is raising your own family, drafting your own players, and keeping your own players. When he makes decisions, it's, it's about football, it's about how can we help the team win. You have to keep your eye on the ball and make sure you don't stray from what you're trying to accomplish. We're in the draft room. You have to make decisions that are based on what's good for the team. There are certain requirements that we think you have to have to be able to play in the NFL. Height, weight, speed, all that sort of stuff, the analytical thing. But then there's also the, the football part. What sets Ted apart, he, he really spends a lot of time on the road. So when we make a decision on a player, he's most likely talked to that player, he's talked to the coach, he's talked to the trainer. So we're making informed decisions. There are Particular players, I think that you come alongside uh, during the course of your career, and you and you see something different. You know, Ted has always been a guy who cares deeply about this team and about his job. Uh, he's a scout at heart. He loves watching tape, and he, you know, he really, really cares about the guys. And it comes across anytime he talks to the team. It could be someone you wind up taken in the sixth round, 
or it could be someone that you, you wind up picking in the first round. Thompson's first draft as GM. That was a long day, April uh, 23rd, 2005. I was the last in the green room. He selects quarterback Aaron Rodgers of California. Rodgers is the 24th overall pick. We all assumed uh, going into the draft that he would go, you know, three or four or five or something like that. Everyone knew it was going to be him or Alex Smith who would go first in that draft. We joked about uh, who would be the last one in the green room, how long they would have to wait. We all thought, you know, after the first 10 picks, we'd probably all be out of there on a plane, on our way to our next city, excited about the opportunity. And we weren't in the market, so to speak, for a quarterback. John Madden used to always say, the toughest time to find a quarterback is when you really need one. That was in the day when they would show people in the, in the side room. I'd look up there every once in a while and, and I'd see Aaron, you know, just sitting there and agonizing, I'm sure. And he sits there and sits there and sits there. It was about four and a half hours, uh, cameras on me, kind of some cleanup crew going on around, around me, every uh, little, uh, Facial expression was uh, was captured. As it gets close to our choice, Ted says to me, he says, can we step out of the draft room for a minute and talk? I remember um, taking a little 30 minute off camera break as we got to picks 14, 15, 16, knowing I wasn't gonna be picked and uh, wondering what was gonna happen, wondering why uh, people had passed on me. Did they need a quarterback for the next season? No. So he calls me out of the room and he says, if, if Aaron Rodgers is there, Bob, I'm going to take him. We're going to catch some heat because Brett's still playing excellent football. And I said, Ted, it's your ball club. And lo and behold, when he got to be our pick, he was there. Thompson did something that had never been done. Green Bay is on the clock, and I got a call on my cell phone. It was the first time, really, where a general manager or anybody drafted a future Hall of Fame quarterback to follow in the footsteps of another Hall of Fame quarterback. And I was like, what, well, Packers gonna pick me? Then I can pick me, they got Favre. It was gonna become a need. I mean, that's why, that's why the pick was so special. By then, people knew that time was running out on Favre. I didn't really even hear it. It was so loud uh, in the Javits Center. I think everybody was giving me the obligatory uh, cheer because they know they knew how long I was sitting around. And we're doing a show in front of fans in Lambeau Field's atrium. And everybody starts booing. And why were they booing? Well, because the Packers needed a pass rushing defensive end difference maker. I got bad mail when Ted Thompson decided to draft Aaron Rodgers. Brett Favre had announced a couple of weeks earlier he was coming back. Doug Peterson was the backup. The Packers were fine at quarterback. They didn't need to waste a first round draft choice on a quarterback. Everybody kind of left the room and Bob Harlan came up to me and was like, this guy's, this guy's good, right? Like, he's really good. And I was like, he's awesome. Everybody said, why in the world are you taking a quarterback? Particularly when 23 other teams passed him by. It was the right thing to do. And that was the thing about Ted. He was never afraid to do the right thing. Ted Thompson does not get the credit he deserves. And some people say, well, he locked into Aaron Rodgers. I couldn't disagree more. As a, a person in Ted Thompson's position, you always have to be thinking about the future. I always appreciate uh, him taking a chance on me. It took more courage for him to take Aaron Rodgers than pretty much anybody else in the NFL because he had Brett Favre. The Packers are gonna be around for a long time and so he was, he was looking at who would be the future quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. What that did for this franchise is immeasurable. But the Packers are struggling on the field. The 2005 season ends with a dismal 4-12 finish. Green Bay's first losing season since 1991. After six seasons, head coach Mike Sherman is fired. They tried to work together for a year. Ted had even given him a, a contract extension. Mike was still bitter, and Ted knew that that wasn't going to work out. We interviewed probably 12 or 14 people during a extended period of time. I was being interviewed based on what I've done in my career and in the potential of what, what Ted was looking for. Mike McCarthy, offensive coordinator of the 49ers, is hired as the Packers head coach. 
McCarthy served as the Packers quarterback coach in 1999, an offensive coordinator of the New Orleans Saints for five years before heading to San Francisco. I knew how important that position is here. I'm sure it is in every place in the NFL, but that position is more important here, I think, than some. At age 42, he is the NFL's youngest head coach. Bob Harlan met me at the door. He opened the door and said, welcome home, Michael. And that, that kind of knocked, knocked me over because you know, I was just here to interview. So um, I thought that was, a, I thought, you know, this is off to a good start. I'm going to have a chance at this thing. I liked his Pittsburgh background, Moxie. I remember talking to Marty Schottenheimer about the interview process. He says, just be yourself. Mike is someone who is a tough, no-nonsense uh, person. That appealed to me very much, and he is all about football. Mike McCarthy's commitment to building the team means building relationships with the players and the community. He is embraced by all. The first time we talked, which uh, he doesn't like to remember this, but basically went like this, 2006. Hey coach, how you doing? Hey. We took Alex, I was there, now I'm here, you're my guy, let's move on. Oh, okay, all right, cool, can't wait. <laughs> he's very demanding, but very forgiving, and he's willing to look past the little things in order for you to grow. Mike's a huge hearted guy. He is, he's got a humongous heart, cares about the guys, cares about his job. He's always been, you know, part uh, angry Pittsburgh dad, and then part big teddy bear. Mike brought a no-nonsense approach to how he wanted to run the football team. He's always gonna present a consistent message, give us uh, you know, exactly what we need. He's a guy that was schooled in the passing game. He's able to school others in the passing game, quarterbacks and skill position players. And yet there's a hard-nosed edge to him down to earth. Mike McCarthy is at his best. When there's all kinds of negativity swirling, when there's injuries, who's gonna play? He, he bears down, he's a competitor, he likes to prove people wrong. He's got a sixth sense for dealing with people and knowing when to put his foot on the gas and when to back off. He's much like Mike Holmgren, they're kind of cut out of the same mold and they're both been perfect fits for Green Bay. Both very creative offensive minds, both very good motivators. Different personalities, certainly. They're both extremely attention to detail. Every detail matters. As McCarthy prepares for his first season as head coach, in the spring of 2006, the Packers reach an agreement with free agent defensive back Charles Woodson. They say all good things come to an end. Uh, so I was with the Oakland Raiders, and my time there had run its course, and uh, I was a free agent. A Heisman Trophy winner out of Michigan, Woodson played eight years with Oakland and is a four-time Pro Bowl pick when he signs with the Packers. Ted, even in free agency, he made a couple of free agent acquisitions that were critical. Charles Woodson, Ryan Pickett, Julius Peppers, you know, I think as time goes on, people forget that he was active. He was very selective. When he made a free agent pickup, that guy made a difference for the Packers. Green Bay was the one that was most interested. I don't know that he was all that thrilled about coming. There were some people that I knew that had come through Green Bay as a player at some point in time, and they didn't have favorable memories of Green Bay. And so they shaped my perception. In every sense of the word, he was just too cool. And I mean that in, in the nicest way possible. And when you were around Charles, you couldn't help but have a smile on your face just because of the way he carried himself. He'd always say stuff like, I got your back. And when Charles Wilson's got your back, you got some pretty good back. What people respected about me as a player is that they knew that each week that I stepped onto the football field, I was gonna give them everything I had. Nothing more, nothing less. Players like Charles and Reggie White and Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre, players like that, they're, they're a joy to be around. When they're playing the game, when they're running and free, it's almost like, you know, Colts in the mountain running and, and doing, it's just a natural thing for them. 
McCarthy records his first season as head coach at 8-8. Eight and eight. I thought Mike did a great job of taking his position and then taking it to the next level. He's also constantly evolving. He comes back with different things. He studies leadership in detail, takes it very seriously. 2007, in just his second season at the helm, he leads the Packers to a 13-3 record, taking first place in the NFC North. He's like a real regular guy, Einstein. His grasp of X's and O's is off the charts. And yet he can talk about them in very every man's terms, so it's not above the players. McCarthy becomes the first Packers coach since Vince Lombardi to lead the team to a championship game in just his second season. With a new coach guiding the way, the 2007 season proves Brett Favre is playing at his prime. From his first start in early 1992 to his record-breaking accomplishments throughout his career, Favre has become one of the NFL's greatest quarterbacks. The records and things like that really don't matter. Maybe one of the most impressive feats uh, uh, during Brett Favre's Green Bay Packers career was the Packers had the best record in the NFL from his first start with the Green Bay Packers to his last start. It's gonna be the way you played and, and, and how you played and your passion. Favre throws his 421st career touchdown pass in a 23-16 victory at Minnesota to break Dan Marino's NFL record. A little over two months later, December 16, 2007, Favre breaks another Marino career record, this time for passing yards in a 33-14 victory over the St. Louis Rams. He sets the record on a seven-yard pass to Donald Driver early in the fourth quarter and finishes the game with 61,405 total passing yards. Records are meant to be broken, but how you play and the legacy you leave by the type of teammate um, will last forever. The Packers are playoff bound. In the NFC Divisional playoff game, Favre throws three touchdown passes and Ryan Grant rushes for 201 yards. The Packers overcome an early 14-point deficit to beat Seattle 42-20 at Lambeau Field, January 12th, 2008. When Favre was playing, you felt like if they were playing at home in the playoffs, that they couldn't be beaten at Lambeau Field. Just eight days later, Favre throws a costly interception in overtime, setting up a game-winning field goal for the Giants. New York prevails 23-20. to Even with home field advantage and the frozen tundra on their side, the run to the championship comes to an end for the Packers and the gunslinger who wears number four. The difference between the Super Bowl winners and the, and the team that has the first draft choice the following year, which means they had the worst record, the difference is about this much. Traditionally, half our games are decided by a touchdown or less. And that's the, the competition in the league is what is one of the great selling points of the NFL. January 2008, the Packers name Mark Murphy as their new president and CEO as Bob Harlan plans his retirement from the game. We had a meeting and the majority of the people decided that uh, Mark Murphy was what we wanted. So the Packers, uh, you know, they were in the middle of a pretty special year. You know, I think Brett Favre was having statistically one of his best years ever. I was very excited about the opportunity. He understands our business from every side. He uh, loves that community. Uh, he recognizes the importance of the Green Bay franchise to the NFL. Mark listens. He's got a keen eye for things and he can contribute in the conversations even if it's something that's not under his ballywick as the president. It's partly his knowledge, uh, but it's also his uh, character and his integrity and his leadership skills. 
very solid, very steady. He, uh, he takes as much time as he possibly can to make a decision. Uh, if he needs to make a quick decision, he's always ready to do that. But he really likes to collect a lot of different data points and then put them together. He's a good person. He understands football, understands the game, having played it for such a long time. It's all about leadership. He was a great leader when he played for the Redskins. He was a leader at Colgate and Northwestern, and he's a leader in the NFL today. January 28th, 2008. After 19 distinguished seasons as president, Bob Harlan says goodbye to the day-to-day -day running of the Green Bay Packers. I have great admiration for the eight people who preceded me as president. We don't own the team. We're caretakers. The day that Bob Harlan took over and hired Ron Wolf, the whole mindset of the approach to this organization changed. It restored us to success and respectability on the field in the NFL. I launched a $24 million stock sale. And of course, the crown jewel, you know, the, the renovation of Lambeau Field, which has assured the team's success and its a continuation into the future. I always answered my own phone. I said, why do you do that? I said, because the people are calling our owners. <laughs> I don't own the team. The guy calling me owns the team. He deserves to talk to somebody. Bob Harlan certainly never took his eye off football first. That was always uh, the, the, the first priority for the organization. I hope people look back at me and say he, he was a good caretaker while he was here. March 6th, 2008, at a press conference in the Lambeau Field Atrium. But uh, I am officially retiring from the NFL and Green Bay Packers. And uh, as much as I've thought about what I would say and um, how. That's a difficult time, you know, for players. You know, when do you leave? How do you leave? And uh, I know that Brett, uh, you know, kind of really uh, wrestled with that decision. He started every game for the franchise for 16 seasons, a feat perhaps never to be duplicated, and was named NFL MVP in 95, 96, and 97. You know, it's funny, I've watched him. hundreds of players retire. And you wonder, what that would be like. Thank you, prepared. Uh. Brett Favre took over the Packers when they were losers for a quarter of a century. You got to give the guy a lot of, a lot of credit because he's, he's done some remarkable things in the NFL. Brett would never want to take a hit and let the, the tackler know that, that he was having trouble. He'd stand up and look at us and say, is that the best hit you got? I remember getting in the faces of big defensive linemen. Greatest competitor I've ever been around. He was fearless. Brett played the game all day, every day that way, which is incredible at that position. It was just a fearlessness of, I'm okay with what comes blowing back at me if I make a mistake. I had never heard him say, look what I've done. He's always said, look what my teammates do to make me look good. The great thing about Brett, he was a guy that, uh, People loved being around him. He was fun. He treated the game as if he was still nine or 10 years old. It was a great teammate. He was the ultimate competitor. We always looked at it as, man, I mean, can you believe they pay us to do this? The one makeup that you really have to have uh, to play the game of football in the NFL, uh, you have to love the game. Not just showing up on Sundays and playing football, but love the process. Love being around his teammates in the locker room, practice, and really love the journey to getting to where he needs to be to be a great player. Brett was a huge clown, and he, he seemed to keep everything light when it needed to be, and then he would uh, bring up the intensity when he felt it needed to be. He just was able to keep a perspective of keeping it just light enough to give him the freedom to, to kind of sling it anywhere. I would hope that people would say, that guy's having fun. And if I were to play, that's the way I would play. That's what I want people to think of when they think of me. My goodness, that guy had heart, he had desire. He's never missed an NFL game, which is pretty remarkable, especially in today's game. 
but he was always willing to step out and do a tough thing, playing hurt, playing injured, when the team needed him or wanted him. There would be weeks when I would walk through the locker room on like a Wednesday, and Brett could hardly move. He was so beat up from the previous Sunday. And yet, come the next Sunday, he was out on that field, ready to go. You can definitely make the argument that Brett Favre perhaps is the greatest Packer of all time. Just five months later, Favre announces he's changed his mind and wants to continue playing. He's a competitor. He didn't want to admit it was over. He thought he could compete till he was 50 if that's what it took. We moved on and uh, we felt we had a good young quarterback in Aaron Rodgers and installed him as a starter. I don't blame the Packers for saying, wait, we've already moved forward. Uh, but it made for a very awkward transition for everybody involved. even. As a reporter, you kind of felt like you were watching a longtime marriage come apart and you liked both sides and you just didn't know where to go. Once Favre is reinstated, the Packers trade him to the Jets. The best executives trust their gut, whether it's Ron Wolf trading a first round pick for Brett Favre or Ted Thompson selecting Aaron Rodgers and then knowing it was time to say goodbye to Brett Favre because Aaron Rodgers was ready. You have to know what you're doing in your gut is right. Believe in that person, execute the decision, and follow through on it. How do you replace Brett Favre like replacing Lou Gehrig? If you're going to replace a uh, legendary Hall of Fame quarterback, it's really good to have an Aaron Rodgers to replace him. <laughs> After two seasons waiting in the wings, Aaron Rodgers moves under center as the Packers' starting quarterback. The Packers believed in him, and they had the strength of conviction to turn the page on arguably the greatest and most likable player in Packers history, knowing that it was best for the franchise. Favre and Rodgers are two different styles and both brought something really special to that position. They are two different quarterbacks. Uh, you always hear about the gunslinger, Brett, Aaron Rodgers, sharpshooter. I had the privilege of playing with both of them and being the transition guy between the two. Aaron has tremendous presence. He's very likable within the team. The first start is like a blur to me. Uh, the things I remember is kind of the, the interaction with the, uh, the Vikings. Their goal was to rattle me. And there was a lot of trash talking from those guys uh, throughout the uh, early part of the game. I actually feed on that kind of uh, interaction. I enjoy it. He's a different guy than Brett Favre. You wouldn't want him to be the same guy. Really didn't get going uh, in the first quarter and then hit Greg Jennings uh, at the end of the first quarter on a deep pass, which kind of uh, settled me down a little bit and got into the game and threw a really awkward first touchdown uh, pass as a starter. The 2008 season ends with a third place spot at six and 10. You know, it was kind of an up and down season. They didn't get to the playoffs. Uh, it was a very difficult run. He has a real sense of responsibility that uh, he's a leader of the organization. He takes that responsibility seriously. As a quarterback, you wear a number of different hats, as they say. You have a number of different roles within the organization. I don't think anybody predicted this kind of success. I think he earned this with incredibly hard work uh, and a passion to become the player he's become. You know, I have to have incredible focus, preparation. Your performance has to be consistent. Um, you have to be a good citizen, good in the community, have a 360 understanding of uh, what it means to be the quarterback in Green Bay. He demands perfection out of himself and all of those around him. He might be the most gifted quarterback that I've ever seen. When you look at you know, his uh, arm strength, his accuracy, and then his athletic ability. When you talk about the things a quarterback has to be, right near the top of the list was he has to be a great passer. and. And Rodgers is one of the best ever, if not the best ever. The stuff he can retain, his knowledge of the game, his understanding of what he can do physically, understanding what we can do as an offense, um, what our team needs, I think it all starts in his head. All the, all the things that you imagine what uh, someone of his stature would have to possess, he has it. He's uh, a wonderful player, a wonderful teammate. I went to the office Christmas party that year and Aaron and I were talking. I said, I, I admire you, the way you've handled the PR and the dignity and the class this year. And he said, Bob, it's been tough. 
2009 comes around and now they're ready to win. October 18th, the Packers against the Detroit Lions at Lambeau Field. Wide receiver Donald Driver breaks Sterling Sharp's Packers record for career receptions. He catches his 596th career pass in the first quarter. With a strong start, the 2009 season shows new promise and a new unlikely foe. Former Packers quarterback Brett Favre joins the Minnesota Vikings, a move many Packer fans could not soon forgive. I knew it was going to happen. It was inevitable that it was going to happen. So I, I didn't even want to hear about it. I didn't want to know what was going on. Hated to see Brett Favre go. Hate to see him even more in Minnesota, especially having success in Minnesota. In typical Favre fashion, he leads the Vikings to a 30-23 win over the Packers at the Metrodome in October, and again to a 38-26 victory at Lambeau in November. I could not stand the thought of coming to Lambeau Field and hearing him booed. Whenever we played Minnesota on those, those years, I never watched the game, I never listened to the game. There was such a high regard for Brett Favre and you want him to still be in a Packers uniform, you don't want him to play for anybody else. When he came back with the Viking and beat the Packers at Lambeau Field, uh, he wasn't jumping up and down with joy, but you could see the smile on his face 2009 is also the year that sees linebacker Clay Matthews become the first Green Bay rookie since James Lofton in 1978 to be selected to the Pro Bowl. Clay is like the Mad Hatter. You know, you just never know what he's going to do, but it always seems to work. When you have a passion for the game, you obviously want to make an impact for it. You want to be the difference maker. It's a high risk, high reward business. Sometimes he may get blocked, he may get knocked down but he's, he's right back up, you know, and that's the thing that makes a great player a great player. Rodgers leads the Packers to an 11-5 season and into an NFC wildcard playoff game against Arizona. 09 was, was really when I felt that it turned. I felt that the, you know, the program was in order, the players were, were totally bought in. Just a lot of really good things coming together. It turns out to be the highest scoring postseason game in NFL history. Quarterbacks Aaron Rodgers and Kurt Warner combine for 802 yards passing and nine touchdowns. After a hard fought battle, the Packers lose 51 45 in overtime. We had a tough loss out there in Arizona. In Green Bay, it's about winning and not just winning and going to the playoffs, it's about winning championships. Anything less than that, it's a lost season. They lose an epic playoff game, but this was a, I think we in Green Bay realized, okay, Packers have a chance to win with Aaron Rodgers, a quarterback. Rodgers closes the 2009 season with 500 plus passing attempts and eight or less interceptions. It becomes the first of many such seasons. You have to have incredible focus on what you're doing, uh, your goals, and an understanding of the steps it takes to get there. So the 2010 season held a lot of promise. There's a few iconic spots, uh, jobs, if you will, positions across all sports that have a different uh, feel to them, a different importance based on the place you play, the history there, and your place within sports. And this is one of those places, quarterback at the Green Bay Packers. We knew Aaron Rodgers was good, but we didn't know he was Aaron Rodgers. He could go down as the best quarterback to ever play the game, statistically. Star goes back to throw, fires a pass, completes to McGee. I came back that my first year in Minnesota to the 70,000 booze.
we were both captains for that game. And the, the memory I have of my whole like Minnesota experience with Favre was that coin toss on Lambeau Field. on the G in the center of the field. It's he and I looking at each other. Everybody's booing us. The Packer captains aren't out there yet. So it's like we're on an island out there. There's only two people on literally planet Earth that can know what that's like, and it's him and I. And we just look at each other and, and you know, without saying anything, kind of say it all. There'll be nothing but, you know, that look <laughs> that we had at that moment that can summarize it.